graduates. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me here today, and congratulations to all of you. You have made it. Completing law school gives each and every single one of you an opportunity to go places and meet faces that no other profession does, period. I cannot stress enough that with your law degree, you have been given the keys that open many, many doors. Some are very traditional, like those of a law firm, but many of the opportunities in front of you lead to paths that you have never contemplated. I'm going to tell you just three stories to illustrate the path I have taken to where I am today, which I could not have anticipated when I sat in your place as a Western Law graduate. And then what I believe should be your promise to yourselves, this school, and the practice of law more broadly. The first is simply about finding joy in what we do. So for me, I always knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was going to be a lawyer. During my years practicing, uh, I primarily worked, as you heard, at one of the iconic Seven Sisters. In some ways, this period of my life was like a TV show. There were complex legal problems, late nights, I spent time in court, I even gowned in the Court of Appeal in my first week of practice. The lifestyle required a lot of sacrifice, but the highs were amazing. And goodness, when I made partner, I felt like I had won the lottery. Here's the funny thing, though. Looking back at that time in my career, I think if I would have been a little bit more self-aware, I would have realized that firm life was not a long-term fit for me at an earlier stage. I spent long days and even longer nights writing and then rewriting complex briefs that could be hundreds of pages long. Well, I was technically strong, and it has taken me years to understand this, and even longer to admit it, I didn't really enjoy the work. And it's not that I didn't want to work hard. On the contrary, I learned that I actually loved to work hard, very much enjoyed working with clients, and directing teams of brilliant professionals. It was just, unlike all of my wonderful colleagues, my enjoyment in writing briefs, going to court, and thinking about pure law did not increase one's experience and seniority made it seem easier. When I contrast that with what I do today, there is simply no comparison. I now lead the applied data analytics practice for Deloitte, and my days are, are spent finding growth through M&A deals, developing new products and solutions, working with clients, in my case still mostly around legal tech, and managing our teams of data scientists, machine learning experts, developers, and designers. It has taken me this long to understand that a career is not about a single company or role, but it is an added dimension to the joy of life. I truly wish for each of you that you can be as grateful for work as I am. You should view this joyfulness as an imperative. Everyone has to be junior and pay his or her dues for a period of time. But if you're not enjoying what you're doing when you're truly applying yourself, it might just be the wrong fit. We are in a world, a legal world, that is changing faster and faster. And that means that we as lawyers have even more options than we ever had before. Big law, small law, startups, legal tech, in-house, business, CEOs. We should not see this new dynamic as limiting, but rather as presenting each of you with even more optionality. Which brings me to my second story about getting in the game and becoming resilient in this changing environment. Back to when I was a lawyer, I had this nagging feeling that the whole profession of law was right for a major disruption. Now this sense is old news now, your dean just said it. But back almost a decade ago, this was not at all a certainty. No one really talked about technology, outsourcing, or alternative fee arrangements. In fact, the year I quit my job, the legal outsourcing conference was canceled for lack of interest. In any event, on one cold day in January, right after New Year's, I went in and quit my dream job to start a company uh, that saves clients money on their legal bills through the use of technology and outsourcing. This was a winning proposition, or so I thought. I can tell you um, that I speak from the personal experience of every entrepreneur when I say that failure is an essential part of the journey. I can't tell you how many people, in particular, my relatively new partners at the law firm, quite kindly sat me down and told me I was making a giant mistake. 
So what did I do? I emptied my entire savings account and started to build a company. As my first order of business, I rented an office about the size of this room, purchased 50 computers, desks, chairs, and other office accoutrement. And looking back, I have no idea why this seemed anything other than absolutely insane. So once the office was set up, I then went to find my first client. In retrospect, that was probably the wrong order of operations. <laughs> so one month went by, the phone didn't ring, which was fine. I was prepared. Two months without a single client, still fine. Um, then three was distinctly less fine, and the money was dwindling. So I started to get the sinking feeling that I had thrown away the career I had worked so tirelessly to build for nothing. And needless to say, things were starting to look pretty bleak. Then, finally, in month four, I caught a break. I called a good friend and begged her to let me do some free work for her firm. Um, and she caved, so uh, ATV Legal finally had its first pro bono client. <laughs> Clearly, working in that manner wasn't going to make my business a success, but it was a start, and it was an opportunity for me to begin proving my concept to the market. So eventually, I stopped doing work for free, and it wasn't too long before the challenge of building a robust sales pipeline was outweighed by the challenge of assembling teams and infrastructure to actually do the work. 50 computers quickly became 100, 150, 200, 300, and so on. 3,000 square feet became 5,000, then 6,000, then 10,000. And I needed to quickly identify and promote leaders, build mutual trust with those people, all while ensuring that we delivered a top quality product. But even as the existential threat faded into the background, let me tell you that the challenges and failures kept coming. With no formal training in running a company, I was reading books on business and sales, trying to figure it out as I went along, and I was constantly testing out new theories in real time. Some were better than others. Most importantly, I was scouring the newswires for hints of coming mergers and acquisitions. When I would catch the scent of the deal I would chase relentlessly, I knew I had to get a piece of every single deal to keep the growth going, so I would approach counsel on both sides with my pitch. My overtures were often rebuffed, which was tough, but pausing to lick my wounds never really felt like an option. I simply had to find another angle, another way in. Now looking back, even um, I think the process was a little insane, but it's amazing how often it was possible to snatch a victory from defeat. Um, when I was more obsessed with the prospect of success, and bothered by that fear of failure. Fast forward a few years, and the growth trajectory was robust. And just as importantly, the foundation of the business felt sound, finally. So much so, in fact, that I was able to take a maternity leave uh, from my business after my first child was born. And it was around that time that I found myself negotiating the sale of my business to Deloitte. We closed the deal at the end of January 2014, about four or five years, uh, after I quit my established job to become an entrepreneur. Despite the happy ending to that chapter, um, a chapter which, by the way, feels pretty different <coughs> now, um, this story is not about the joy of success. Although I'm proud of what I built, I know that each time I try something new again, it will be all about resilience. Take most recently my decision to accept the offer to lead our national data analytics practice. I had to overcome a fear of failure once again and put my reputation on the line with confidence to yet again uh, have confidence in that ability to execute. Now there are always cynics. How can you lead a team of a couple hundred technical experts when you're not one yourself, when you're a lawyer? Um, I still get rattled when someone I trust doesn't respond with the shared enthusiasm for an idea I have that I put my heart and soul into. I have to get past that. I have to trust my intuition and the work that I've done and just go for it. You see, life is not about sitting on the sidelines, waiting to ridicule those who explore, experiment, and push themselves when they stumble and fall. You will ultimately get so much more satisfaction and fulfillment if you can be the person who hears the criticism, that has the resilience to get up, dust yourself off, and persevere. In this ever-changing legal market, Resilience may be the single most important skill you develop. It takes great courage, but in order to be truly extraordinary, by definition, you need to have a willingness to be unconventional in a world that is vested in the status quo. The third story is short, I promise, and is simply a plea. At various points in my career, 
I have worked too hard for comfort, both in the distant past and honestly, more recently. When I worked on my first hearing, for example, or on my honeymoon in Africa as an entrepreneur, or even just a few months ago when I closed the biggest deal of my career. These are moments where I was extremely proud of what was being accomplished, but where I forgot the bigger picture. We need to strive for greatness, and that may require sprinting flat out on occasion. For example, those of you headed into articles, that time might be now. But that also necessarily includes a general context of balance and wellness. Better yet, we need time for ourselves, and then still time left over to give to others. The most important jobs I do are raising my kids with my wonderful husband, and much further down the list, the board work and volunteering I do with a number of nonprofits. I would encourage you to not lose sight of those items that are important and dear to each of you. Time is a precious commodity. I hope to convince you to manage it accordingly looking forward at the start of your careers rather than live with any regrets later on. As a work in progress, this is something I constantly need to remind myself of, not to lose the forest for the trees. Let's not forget what we're here for. Now, even if you're sure about your path as I was about mine, life can still surprise and delight you. The cliche of luck being when opportunity meets preparation does in fact seem to be quite true. In that vein, try to remember to seek true joy in your work because it's a gift. Challenge yourself to take calculated and well thought out risks and keep getting up when you falter. And finally, don't forget what life is all about and try to live in a balanced and thoughtful manner. The point, after all, is to leave the world and our work within it in better shape than how we found it. It is a tall order, but I know you can do it. You are, after all, Western law grads. Trust that this institution has now instilled you with good judgment and a strong foundation for business, both in terms of law and more broadly. Seek mentorship and listen to a variety of opinions, but then, in the end, have the strength of your own conviction to trust your instinct and enjoy wherever the path takes you. Thanks so much.